So welcome everyone to this, the uh, third of four um, Saturday morning sessions. So let's start this with a very brief uh, meditative beginning. I haven't done that before. So try to find a comfortable upright posture. And then perform a brief breath awareness practice to calm and settle and gently focus the mind. So you can do it whichever way uh, you're used to doing it. Like maybe take a series of five or six slow, deep, even breaths. letting go of any um, tired or anxious energy as you breathe out and bringing in a clear revitalizing energy as we breathe in. And then Bring to mind and invite into the space before each one of us, whatever person from the past or the present who embodies for you those fully awakened qualities, such as enlightened loving kindness, compassion and wisdom, and the skillful means to benefit others that you yourself wish to cultivate in yourself so that your life may become as meaningful and worthwhile as possible. So for example, one could choose uh, the Buddha, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, one of our other teachers, or anyone, anyone who for you embodies these qualities. And then we focus our mind on this person. Again, it could be someone from the past, someone who's already passed away, someone who's alive. What's important is that we feel this heart connection, this admiration for the qualities that he or she represents. And then we take heartfelt refuge in this source of inspiration and imagine that his or her precious qualities shine forth in the form of radiant light which flows into us filling us with inspiring strength According to tradition, at this point, we would um, recite the four-line prayer, the first two lines of which are refuge. Such as, we go for refuge until our enlightenment to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. And then for the last two lines, we cultivate the precious bodhicitta motivation so we can think, generate this bodhicitta motivation, thinking to fulfill our own highest potential and thereby be able to benefit others limitlessly. So think along the following lines. Due to the positive energy generated by this altruistic, atten <laughs> this altruistic intention, 
And the Dharma activity we're about to engage in here and now, think, may I attain full awakening and thereby be of maximum benefit to all sentient beings. May I attain full awakening and thereby be of maximum benefit to all sentient beings. And you can personalize it by thinking of a few very specific beings whom you wish to help, or to send out the, uh, these loving, kind thoughts of support towards. And having established some heart connection with this person or these persons, then for the third and last time, think, may I attain full awakening and thereby be of maximum benefit to all sentient beings. Then let us recognize how intimately interconnected our own individual life is with the lives of all the other beings who share this planet with us. Using the power of imagination, hover in space far above the earth and look down on our home planet far below, observing all the various forms of activity that continuously takes place there. Observe how the production and distribution of even a few of the necessities for sustaining just our own individual life, such as food, clothing, and shelter, how this requires the combined efforts of hundreds, thousands, millions, perhaps even billions of other beings just on this one planet. Just the growing and production and distribution of food, especially if we count all the insects that are involved in the land where the food is grown, easily comes to millions and perhaps billions of other sentient beings. Getting a sense of this, all of this happening right here on this earth from which we are benefiting. Think, how could I ever manage to survive, let, let alone thrive without all their support? And then, also consider that each one of these many beings who's providing this support for our individual life and the lives of all of the other beings on the planet, each one has as great a wish to experience happiness and be free of pain and suffering as we ourselves do. In a very real sense then, all the beings with whom we share this fragile planet are, as His Holiness the Dalai Lama often points out, we're all like members of one family. Let the reality of our intimate interconnection with others and our reliance upon them for our own welfare become clearer and more vivid in our mind. And also recognize that despite all of the differences between ourselves and all these many others, in one way, we are exactly alike. 
in desiring to be happy and healthy and wishing to avoid even the slightest mental, physical, or emotional pain and suffering. As this mutual interdependence with others becomes clearer and clearer to our mind, and as we realize the urgent necessity of dealing effectively with the widespread distrust and conflict that threatens our very survival these days. Allow the concern you now feel for those you consider your friends and loved ones to grow and encompass everyone, even those you currently do not particularly like or agree with even those who you regard as strangers or maybe even enemies. But allow the concern you feel naturally for your friends and loved ones to encompass everyone. As the scope of our loving concern for others slowly but steadily grows bigger and wider. Imagine it. Imagine this loving kindness, this compassionate intention to be of benefit to others. Imagine it appears as a horizontal white disk, like the full moon resting in the center of our being at the, level, at the level of our heart. Now through the next stages, of this meditative practice, see if we can maintain a subtle subliminal awareness of the presence in our heart of this disc-like compassionate bodhicitta motivation, even while we turn our attention to another aspect of the practice. So now, let's try to recall what His Holiness the Dalai Lama said in the video we referenced last week. And as was quoted, he said, nothing whatsoever exists in the way it appears to our mind. Nothing whatsoever exists in the way it appears to our mind. It's a very short sentence, but if we think of its implications, if we think of what it's saying, it's truly mind blowing, isn't it? Nothing exists the way it appears right now to our mind. Buddhist teachers in the past and continuing up to the present have expressed this key and liberating insight in many different ways. For example, scriptural texts mention the illusion-like illusion or dream-like nature of things. And Kabche Lama Zopa Rinpoche often reminds us that all our experiences, all our experiences, both our pleasant and unpleasant ones, and everything that appears to our mind and senses, both the beautiful and the ugly, 
are like hallucinations. Or the other images that was just used a moment ago, like illusions or dreamlike in nature. So with the exception of highly evolved beings like Buddhas and high level bodhisattvas, Everything that appears to our mind is like an illusion, is like a dream, or as Kepji Sopa Rinpoche likes to say, are like hallucinations. What can we do with a statement like that? Does it really seem to any of us that right now, everything that we see, hear, smell, think about are all hallucinations? That's not something we should just accept on faith, especially because we have to understand what kind of hallucination is really being referred to? Because it's important to be as clear as we can be about what a term like hallucination means in this context, because its usage can differ very significantly from how this term and similar terms are generally used in the world. For example, here's how a term like hallucination might be used in more or less general context. Um, for example, if someone comes down with a virulent disease or has been administered a powerful drug, he or she might see, hear, or feel things that no one else does, where an unaffected person might see just an ordinary looking person, such as one's accustomed neighbor. The affected person may see a frightening monster. Or one person, unaffected, might hear the sound of a gentle breeze, whereas the affected person, the one who came down with the disease or is under the influence of a powerful drug, instead of hearing the sound of a breeze, might feel that he or she is hearing the screams of a crazed banshee. Or consider a doctor who, while examining a patient, sees nothing out of the ordinary when ex examining his or her body, but the patient himself, under the influence of the disease or the drug, might feel as if and actually believe that insects were crawling all over his body. In these types of hallucinatory experience, one object is mistakenly believed to be a very different object. For example, the ordinary looking neighbor is mistakenly believed to be a frightening monster. The way Buddhist teachers use a term like hallucination is not like this. It is not to describe how one existent phenomena is mistakenly believed to be a different object. That is a very easily recognized kind of hallucination. As soon as one over, uh, gets rid of the disease or the drugs go through the system, 
and things return more or less to normal, those hallucinations are no longer seen, are no longer experienced. They're very easily recognized. That easily recognized kind of hallucination is not what the profound teachings of beings like the Buddha, Nagarjuna, Jaitsunkapa are primarily concerned with. They're concerned instead with the hallucinations that are taken to be ordinary reality by all but the most spiritually advanced of beings. Those kind of persistent, pervasive hallucinations are not a matter of what exists, but, but rather about how all existent phenomena falsely appear. So for example, let's say we go to the zoo and there's an elephant there. The fact that we see everything as a, as a hallucination does not mean that we see that elephant as a tiger. What does it mean? It, we, it means that we see an elephant, but the elephant appears to us in a different manner of being that it actually possesses. To ordinary beings, everything that exists falsely appears to exist in a separate, self-contained, independent manner. Or as Lama Yeshe used to say, things appear incorrectly. Things appear to exist concretely as being more solid, separate, self-contained and independent than they actually are. To use the widely accepted terminology of what is considered to be the most profound school of Buddhist philosophy, the Madhyamaka Prasangata, every existent phenomenon falsely appears to exist inherently or we could say intrinsically or objectively or, and in a phrase that Lama Zopa Rinpoche and many other teachers seem to prefer to use, every existing phenomena falsely appears to exist solely from its own side. That's what objectively indicates. When we see something or think about something, that thing seems to be coming to us from the outside and we are just the passive consumer of that image. And we accept it as being reality. Things appear to use the technical language again, to be inherently existent, intrinsically existent, objectively existent, existing from its own side. And it is a, the uh, adherence, the belief to this pervasive false appearance, which is at the root of all afflictions such as the three poisonous minds of hatred, desirous, desirous attachment and ignorance that are in the center of the famous diagram of the wheel of samsaric existence. 
these three poisonous minds being responsible for our creation of the destructive karma and all of the resulting suffering and dissatisfaction it produces. If we think back or listen again to the video that was referenced earlier from previous week, the Dalai Lama indicates that according to the Madhyamaka texts, all things are merely designated, merely labeled by the mind. In a statement that parallels the insights of quantum mechanics, these texts state that nothing whatsoever exists objectively. Everything instead is determined subjectively by the observing consciousness. So now I'd like to bring this session to a close by referring to two Tibetan syllables that occur at the very beginning of the commonly recited praise occurring in the guru yoga practice of Lama Tsongkhapa, in which he is recognized as being the embodiment of the three major bodhisattva deities, Manjushri for wisdom, Chenresik, or Avalokiteshvara, for compassion, and Vajrapani, for power. The first line of that prayer, as many of you know, is Mikme Tsewe Terchen Chenresi, which is usually translated, you, you know, uh, Lama, you are Chenresik, the great treasure of compassion. But before that word for compassion, tsewe, there are the two syllables, mikme, mikme tsewe terchen chenresi. So what is this mikme? Mik means object or observed object. And me is a negative, a negative syllable indicating not or without. Thus, mikme tsewe can be rendered in English in several different ways. Some writers prefer, you know, you are the great treasure of unobservable compassion, or you are the great treasure of non-objectifying compassion, or you are the treasure of objectless compassion. But none of these three really give the indication of what's meant by this. It means even though someone is developing compassion for one, one being or for a whole planet of beings, that compassion isn't holding on to any of them as existing objectively, from its own side, inherently. In other words, it's seeing the object. It's seeing the people on the earth, the people we deal with. It's having compassion for, for them, but that compassion is wedded with a, under, a deep understanding, not just an intellectual realization, but a deep understanding that all the beings that appear to that compassionate mind lack even one atom of inherent existence, that they do not exist the way they're currently appearing to our limited consciousness. And thus we can see them like an illusion, like a dream, and our grasping onto them begins to dissolve. That understanding then can be 
viewed as an upright Vajra, standing on top of the moon disk in our heart. And it's the union of those two, those two types of bodhicitta, the ultimate and the relative, that is the meaning behind this yoga, this all-embracing yoga. Okay. Well, I think that's time for us. <laughs>